che all'epoca eh, i turchi si chiamavano i titi e poi c'erano anche i mitani, al alcuni popoli della Mesopotamia. E quindi Akhenaton ha dovuto inventarsi un metodo strategico per poter limitare queste aggressioni che erano un po' troppo ricorrenti. In, insomma, il suo stratagemma consisteva nel requisizionare i, primo, i primi geniti di questi eh, monarchi in cambio della loro lealtà e di spostare i loro eserciti per difendere le frontiere del regno egizio antico. Di conseguenza, eh, dopo con l'impero romano, siamo nell'imperialismo e anche nel colonialismo, questo modo di interagire a livello delle sue frontiere esterne, oltre il suo continente su altri territori, durante il colonialismo come vedremmo, ha portato a sviluppare molte eh, forme di gestione degli acquisti dei territori, ma anche delle popolazioni lì, ai fini di portare profitto e vantaggi, se no prestigio, a i, i popoli che praticavano queste forme di, di dominazione. Quindi, solo che queste forme di dominazione non sono state senza precedenti, senza conseguenze sui popoli che le hanno subito. E quindi parlare di geopolitica dei corpi è parlare del fatto che la politica non è che smetta di applicarsi nei territori, nello spazio geografico, ma c'è una specie di eh, trasposizione dallo spazio geografico al corpo fisico delle persone. Perché se prima, per esempio, come vedremo con la, eh, il colonialismo, eh, certe pratiche, eh, certi servizi, certe spedizioni, punitive no? che avevano un'incidenza sul corpo anche la psicologia eh, l'organizzazione sociale di molti popoli afrodiscendenti e altri ancora nel mondo eh, hanno avuto questa incidenza io parlo eventualmente di stupri di massa di violazione dei diritti di questi popoli eh, dalle potenze eh, che praticavano queste forme di dominazioni e che hanno portato avanti che sarebbe stata una motivazione anche eh, a fondare il razzismo per continuare a mantenere gli, i vantaggi su questi territori e anche avere una specie di giustificazione no? nei confronti di, di altri popoli o altre autorità per proseguire in queste pratiche che lucravano abbastanza in quell'epoca e anche tuttora possiamo, eh, la cosa che ci porta a fare questo incontro è proprio perché eh, nell'osservazione dei fatti a livello storico ma anche a livello sociale ci siamo accorti che eh, le politiche attuali hanno qualcosa che ricorda questo tipo di pratiche e la cosa che ci spinge anche proprio a aprire questa discussione oggi a livello femminile è che ehm, è uscito un libro ultimamente, eh, penso era nel 2018-2019, eh, che è stato scritto da Pascal Blanchard, ehm, ispirato dagli archivi sul periodo coloniale francese e di altre nazioni, un collegio di ricercatori e storici si è riunito e hanno eh, tentato di eh, consultare questi archivi e sarebbe soltanto il 10% che hanno potuto eh, materializzare in questo libro che si intitola Sesso, razza e colonie, in cui veramente a tutti i livelli si può vedere eh, la percezione e anche l'uso, lo sfruttamento che ne facevano del corpo femminile nero e attualmente ci sono anche dei problemi nella società attuale 
che ci portano a fare un legame tra queste storie del passato e la situazione attuale. Eh, penso che ognuno di noi abbia vissuto un po' con impotenza e forse disapprovazione quel che è successo nel mese di febbraio in pieno lockdown per via del coronavirus abbiamo assistito al linciaggio di un afroamericano in diretta dalla polizia su facebook praticamente e vedere che si organizzano delle manifestazioni antirazziste in giro per il mondo e che poi però qualcuno abbia il coraggio no tipo sembrava fosse una cosa normale come si facesse la grigliata come si facesse la grigliata un barbecue in un parco così era tutto normale no e quindi dopo un po uno dice ok che come si può nel 2000 20 assistere a una scena del genere eh, proprio mh, significa che c'è qualcosa nel sistema che non funziona e quindi bisogna ragionarci sopra e eh, provare a suggerire delle piste di riflessione che magari forse con il concorso di ognuno di noi eh, emergerà una soluzione per risolvere il problema e forse anche perché la gente non ha mai avuto il coraggio o no, non ha mai pensato che fosse importante indagare sull'itinerario della geopolitica eh, per capire eh, dal passato ad oggi, per capire meglio ehm, che forse eh, quello che succede oggi è una conseguenza di molte cose irrisolte nel passato. E a questo punto... Penso di passare la parola a Daphne Budash che ci condurrà nel mezzo di questo pellegrinaggio sulla questione che ci porta qui oggi. Grazie mille. Grazie Patrick per l'introduzione. Um, so we're going to have this uh, uh, event in English now, uh, but if you want to ask question in Italian in the Korea uh, um, Q&A um, chat, you can. Um, we were supposed to have a third speaker, but we can't reach her at the moment, Delphine Diallo. So I think uh, maybe she will join in the middle of the event. Let's see. Uh, but I think we can start now. Um, um, we will start then with Ophelia. Uh, so I'll introduce you first. Uh, thanks, Patrick, for this uh, extensive explanation of, of the, the topic. Um, so Ophelia Balungun is a dancer, choreographer, and teacher. She completed her studies in diverse dance styles at Roehampton University of London. Her artistic work focuses on African, Afro-Caribbean and contemporary techniques, which she uses to create a language that investigates topics like identity, perception of self and race. So Ophelia, I'll leave you the floor. We can't hear you, you have to unmute you, I think. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Daphne. Um, yeah, so as you said, um, What I do is um, trying to investigate how um, people in our society uh, perceive the black body. And what I'm, I say investigation is in my work, um, I'm trying to work with, uh, let's say, after descendant um, people and let's say second generation people to make understand how Uh, a dynamics like racism is being um, embodied into the uh, mind um, dynamics. So I'm gonna just show maybe a little video to kind of give an example of um, what is my practice, my approach to, to dance, and then I'm gonna say a little bit more. So now you're sharing the sound, but not the um, screen. Yeah. Yes. I'm... Okay, no, we can't hear.
So what was interesting to me was the creation of stereotype generalization. So what happened when we lose our individuality and consequently we become a label that society give to us? What happens when we lose the ability of putting ourselves in other people's shoes and our mind start to think in terms of category and consequently develop a distorted perception? So how the label that society gave us influence our lives, our choices, and how we see and perceive reality. There was this particular sequence of movements that Ophelia showed us, which started off by us looking into one direction as if there was something over there that we wanted to reach. And then we actually physically start reaching for it. And this reminded me a lot of um, my childhood. And obviously growing up as the son of a Nigerian dad and a Filipino mom, uh, a lot of my contemporaries didn't particularly look like me. And I felt like in certain stages of my life, when I was in kindergarten, three, four years old, that I was physically striving to be where my contemporaries were. and the prejudgments people have of me or how they expect me to speak or what interest they expect me to have or a combination of the, the several different things of what they expect me to be doing or how they expect me to act, lots of different things. And I think that feeling of displacement has actually been a very big part of my identity and self-identity that I've been working on. So it was quite close to home in that way for me, doing this piece. body exists in a state of equilibrium, but because we interact as living beings with our surrounding, there are instances or a buildup of occurrences that gradually push us away from this equilibrium. And I think healing is the process whereby we find our way back to some state of equilibrium. Hmm. Yeah, so basically that. <laughs> so um connecting to what is the topic of tonight, what is interesting is how the narrative the post-colonial and the colonial narrative and is still on and how this is not something that's just affect the political, uh, economical, geographical, but also um, the psychological side of people of 
body of culture. So how the um, perception of the black body itself is being so like an invasion that didn't, did, is not allowing in 2021, 2020 to body of culture to really like be free from that. And there are some specific dynamics, mental dynamics that is still affecting our journey. So I would, I much prefer to pass to Angelica um, the word that she can provide us with some historical background and, and then kind of coming back to what are the consequences of it and how it is like um, perceived from the artistic point of view, because the fact that art is being affected by it is kind of showing how is important and is urgent that we provide, we do something about that. And I will dive that, I will dive uh, deep into that maybe later in order that the people can have a historical background first. Thank you so much, Ophelia, for sharing your work and um, introducing it. I'm sure, we'll, I mean, I already have a lot of questions for you, but uh, let's give the, some, the mic to Angelica Pesarini. I'm going to present um, really briefly. So she's a faculty member at NYU Florence. Uh, there she teaches a course entitled Black Italia, which is dedicated to the intersectional analysis of racial identity in Italy. She previously worked at Lancaster University as a lecturer in gender, race, and sexuality. Her current work investigates dynamics of race performativity with a focus on colonial and post-colonial Italy. And she also analyzes the racialization of Italian political discourse on immigration. So Angelica, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Daphne. Thank you very much, Ophelia, uh, for, for your in intervention. That is true, was very inspiring for me too. And thank you, Patrick, for in inviting me and organizing this along with Ophelia. So I think actually one I would like to carry on from the question you asked in your in your video, can we heal ourselves, right? As racialized subjects, for example. And so if I think about myself and my experience, uh, I really to keep it kind of narrative and, and informal this evening. Um, uh, I, I noticed since a very young age how I was, um, I was not really part of the nation because I was getting questions that maybe other children of my age were not um, getting, right? So, you know, probably a question we all are familiar with in this panel. So where are you from? Why do you speak such a good Italian? Um, and your questions are never enough. There is always this need to dig and to dissect and to understand how you can be Italian and looking like that. And so this was already something that for me was very clear from since, since a child, this non-neutrality of the gaze, of the white gaze. Um, but then also I, I, I didn't, uh, I kind of never read my history or the history of my family in history textbooks. So I never read really, um, I, I couldn't trace my history like many people could um, because my history uh, stems from Italian colonialism in East Africa. And as we know, colonialism is something really marginal and still there is this very uh, rooted myth of Italiani brava gente, which may seem, you know, nowadays in 2021, maybe is gone. And actually it's not. I was just uh, uh, listening yesterday um, an interview given by um, a member of uh, the, the right-wing party, Fratelli d'Italia, in which this person really repeated word by word the myth Italiani brava gente. So when he was asked about colonialism, he said, Italian colonialism was short, was marginal. We didn't earn much from it. We brought civilization. And uh, we built streets and hospital. If you go now to Eritrea, you see our streets, our hospitals. So um, never, never 
asking the other question, why? Why did you put so many efforts in doing that? Mm? And so I had a little, there was a kind of um, hole in my identity because I knew I was Italian, but I was not colorblind because children are absolutely not colorblind. We are taught since a very young age, our color. And I was uh, made aware that I, I was not white. And so when I started to have questions about these stories, the stories like my family, um, it was very difficult for me to find it up to a certain age. In fact, I had to physically go, uh, for example, in, in East Africa, in Eritrea, in Ethiopia, doing interviews with people born there from the, the colonial and fascist period in order to understand, in, in order to get new knowledge that I couldn't find in Italian uh, history uh, book. So, Somehow through academia, uh, I started to investigate uh, and to prob problematize our, our story. And maybe it was a process of healing, I guess. Uh, you know, everyone find probably their own ways. And then I started to study Italian colonialism when uh, I was doing my um, PhD. I spent the first year really just reading and I felt really ignorant. I felt really ashamed that I didn't know so many things. And I felt shocked that in my, um, uh, in my, yes, yeah, schooling path, I've never been given this, this knowledge that had such a, an impact on modern Italy and even in contemporary Italy, because there are so many legacies from the past, from the colonial past, that is actually not very far away. <laughs> kind of behind the corner if we think about it. And, and so I started to, to study all, all of these facts that for me were unknown, but I was also a researcher. I had to conduct research. And when I approached some methodological uh, ways, uh, approaches to conduct my research, I found black feminism. I found black feminist epistemology. So I used, black feminists and their research methods in order to conduct my own research. And this for me was really crucial and, and fundamental because I learned that every knowledge is situated. I learned that there is, there is not something called the truth. Uh, there are several truths, there are stories. I questioned history. Mm -hmm. uh, his story, and I started to investigate her story. This is a very nice uh, game of words in English. Unfortunately, in Italian, it doesn't work as well, but really to look for women. Where were women in all of this? We know women are, have been historically marginalized and uh, our experiences have always been uh, put uh, in, on a second level, sometimes completely erased. And so I started to um, looking for uh, oral history, oral history of women. And this was, was fundamental. And so when I was looking at how the black body was represented uh, during the colonial and fascist regime, well, um, I discovered many things. Um, what I would like to mention maybe in, in, this, in this occasion is um, a specific phenomenon that is the commodification of the black body. So how the black body started to get used to sell some products and how there was an economic income from this. So how the black body was used to sell and in a way how the black body was eaten. So along with the commodification of the black body, I noticed also a sort of cannibalistic side of, of, of the adverts. And I would like to show you to show you some just to see what I mean. Okay, so you should be you should see my screen now, right? Um, so this was for um, Ambrosoli. So already you see there is always this act of the black character eating, but sometimes also the black character is edible. Um, I would like to show you. 
So here, for example, we we know we are talking about black body because we see the the famous caricature, these very red lips, uh, white gloves, dark skin, so dark we don't even see any more features or, or body. It is a mass of black and these very white teeth. This was for Barilla. Here. Uh, Birra Moretti. So also here you see uh, is if we look at the body, they're drinking beer, but they're very translucent. They're very smooth, and we can see the beer, like if they are literally becoming becoming the beer. And there is always this idea that the body is also what they are advertising uh, with chocolate and coffee specifically. That happened a lot here. Also, you see again the act of licking um, these um, two people, uh, obviously represented in this very um, stereotyped way, the beer, again, Birra Moretti, and these two black bodies licking, uh, licking the, the, this very phallic, right, uh, glass of beer. So there is also this very phallic um, vision in the adverts. Um, no, this, uh, there was another one. Um, again, ecco, this is for uh, ghiaccio, fabbrica ghiaccio. Um, and again, we see literally the person licking the eyes. Um, so there is this very strong connection with the black body being eaten, melting, or eating. Ramshino. Um, Perugina. <clears throat> this one is interesting because actually here we see a white woman being held by this naked black man. But there is another interesting Perugina advert that I don't think I have here, in which the black woman is literally melting and there is a kid licking her, which is very creepy. Um, so I noticed how the black body was consumed was sold and was advertised also in the Italian colonial period. Um, women also played a very important role uh, if we think about relationships. We know uh, there was this uh, practice called Madamato. Uh, Madamato didn't exist before the Italians arrived. So I was specify this because we have heard many times, especially when you know there are the Montanelli um, um, debacles sometimes. Um, so Madamato didn't exist. The Italians invented Madamato. There were some uh, form of marriage in Eritrea before the Italians arrived, uh, and then the Italians took some elements of a certain form of wedding and they transformed it in, into, into Madamato. Madamato was the cohabitation of a, an African um, woman with an Italian uh, man uh, in which the woman was uh, cleaning the house, cooking the food, and also offering uh, sexual services. And this was taken from a practice that was already existing before the Italians arrived. The only difference is that in the um, Eritrean um, society, this was a serious form of, um, was a contracted form of relationship. So uh, people knew what their duties were. So in case of children, the man had to uh, raise the children. Uh, the woman was paid and she, uh, it was sort of contract, right? So everyone was clear on their terms. The Italian twisted a bit this, and so they took only certain aspects. For example, when many children were born, they didn't know their father because the father was gone. Many Italian men who went to East Africa, for example, they were already married in Italy. They already had other families, and so they were created this temporary relationship. And obviously, the men living for uh, Eritrea, for Ethiopia, uh, they were living in Italy with a um, 
very exoticized and fetishized image of black women. Uh, it's interesting to remember that in order to eroticize the invasion of Ethiopia, uh, black shirts, you know, these uh, sometimes very young men, 16, 17 years old, they were given postcards of African women, semi-naked or naked, just to eroticize the, the, the conquest, which was an invasion in reality, uh, just to say, look what is waiting for you. So there was this idea of availability, not only of land, but also of women, this, you know, idea of the Black Virgin, um, the Venus, the Black Venus. And so, the men leaving the, the, the Italy, they were going to Africa with this idea of availability. Um, so there were many, uh, many men had relationships with African women, uh, and not only women. Uh, the archive sources tell us that many soldiers engaged with sexual acts with children, eight nine years old, uh, male and female. So there are some, some sentences of soldier brought to trial because they mm, raped uh, an eight-year-old child, for example, a girl. And they were released because the judge said it was in their costume to have sex at an earlier age. And so that was not a problem. So it's interesting how the women in Italy was not what the idea of woman was applied in the colony. In the colony, there were no women, there were females. This is very uh, powerful in a letter written by Renato Paoli, uh, is mentioned in Giulia Barrera's research, where he's, he was complaining about the lack of women in, in the colony. In fact, he says uh, in his letter, we have black female here, but exuberant, but we don't have women because women are just white. And let's remember, for example, how sexual violence and rape very often was going unpunished because black women were not considered rapeable. They were seen as hypersexualized uh, bodies who were craving for sex. Um, uh, the, the theories at the time was even insinuating that black women were copulating with primates. So so, so um, uh, craving for sex to copulate even with, with, with animals. And Patrick mentioned earlier, um, Sir T.J. Bartman, the so-called Hottentot Venus, who presented a bit this fetishism, right? She was this woman uh, from South Africa, sold to a British uh, entertainer, um, exposed in a cage uh, in, in, in London and then in Paris. Um, where she was performing the savage, right? She was uh, pretending not to speak any language. In reality, she spoke Dutch, that was her first language, and then she spoke English and French, but she was performing the savage for the audience. It was very common at the time also to have the human zoos where you would pay a ticket and you go there and throw peanuts or bananas to the savages. And I think here is important um, another another thing, though, that I uh, for me was very important to highlight the agency of this of these women, because I think it's equally problematic to portray Sir T. J. Bartman, for example, just as a victim. I think it's very disrespectful towards her, because although she came from a context of slavery, she was sold, and she was, in the end, she became a sex worker where uh, when the enthusiasm for her body was uh, lost, uh, she died very young. Her body was dissected and ex ex um, exhibited in the Musée de l'Homme in Paris until 1974 which for me is quite shocking. Until 1974, you could see pieces of Sarah Bartman, Sir T.J. Bartman exposed at the Musée de l'Homme. So it's a, it's a very tragic story, horrible story, but I think we should not forget also her agency um, as, as, as a woman. Um, and this is also what I learned studying Italian colonialism. For example, 
an Eritrean scholar, Ruthie Yob, wrote this beautiful, did this beautiful research on the madamas. So we talked about madamato, and the women cohabiting with Italian men were called madama. Well, in Ethiopia, um, some women, uh, without denying the violence, you know, and the oppression and the segregation, um, it was very complex. It, uh, Love relationship in the colonies was extremely complex. It was not really victims or perpetrators and much more complex than that. The madamas, some madamas, they were being with an Italian, they were improving their lifestyle and their economic power. So some of them actually opened some taverns. And what is interesting is that if on the first floor of the tavern, there were normal clients, probably many Italians, in the underground, they were hosting secret anti-colonial uh, meetings. So the Ethiopian resistance was meeting there, covered by the Madama. I think this is really fascinating. So just to, to remember how, uh, wherever there is oppression, there is resistance. And I think women history and women oral history really tell us this. Thank you, thank you so much, Angelica, for providing this like wide historical context and all like this key aspect of the question. Um, I think that what's interesting here is like you are coming from different field, one like more like a historical, a sociological point of view, and Ophelia with your artistic uh, angle. But both of uh, your work basically question and challenge the. The question of the representation of, of black bodies. And what I find particularly interesting in Ophelia's work is that you actually using like the physicality of your own body uh, in your dance performance to achieve this end of, of uh, rethinking uh, the representation of black female bodies. And um, in that sense, I think that like the, this whole discussion is about the importance for black women to be able to control the image and also to define their own sexuality. So I will like maybe uh, start with um, the first question and then we can, we can maybe open the question to the audience. You can uh, write your question in the Q&A &A, uh, uh, chat and I will, I will take them. Um, so Angelica, when you, I mean, you explain really well how black female bodies has been eroticized. You use the term also commodif uh, commodified uh, by uh, white male colonists and, uh, and the fact that the colonial rule often established a control over uh, black women and also uh, these black women experience physical violence uh, and sexual violence. So, and that the fact that nowadays in our so-called post-colonial Western world, like the, this type of stereotypes are still attached to black female bodies and still, we still need to deconstruct them. So, but my question will be for the both of you, um, we can see that today we have an increasing amount of representation of empowered black women in popular culture. And maybe the most famous example is Beyonce. Uh, that, that appears and presents herself as a powerful black woman. But a lot of pe people, and, and, and Angelica, you mentioned like black feminism, are also criticizing this type of, of uh, product and this type of imagery, saying that actually um, it doesn't really uh, move away from the hypersexualization of the black female bodies, etc. And, and this type of representation in popular culture are still, for some people, still colonial. So I wanted to ask you your opinion about it. Do you think that this kind of representation, like Beyonce, for, for example, are actually participating to the empowerment of black women or is it not the case? Ophelia, do you want to go first? Okay. Well, uh, it's interesting that you mentioned Beyonce because if we think about Bell Hooks, <laughs> she defines Beyonce terrorist. <laughs> so uh, this, is, this is very powerful criticism. Um, Beyonce is, a, is an interesting case because there is a famous video that for me is very telling and that is called When Beyonce Became Black. I don't know if you're familiar with that, which is true. I mean, 
at some point, Beyonce discovered her blackness. Um, and I'm not criticizing this, actually. Uh, everyone has their own journey. But I, I think here, really, we can see how capitalism is really connected, right, with blackness and, and, and gender. I mean, Beyonce and, and Jay-Z, they rented the Louvre to shoot a video. So this really tells us about the immense economic power these two people alone have and the immense influence they have. When, when, became, when Beyonce became Black, it was probably at the Super Bowl when she um, made that for many shocking performance, uh, very um, kind of militant in a way, um, sending a lot of reminders of the Black Panthers. It's just the question is, you know, what is performative and where is the real work? Mm -hmm. Because you need to do a certain work that I think she has been doing after that. Uh, I think, for example, with, with Lemonade, for, she, she produced, I think, an incredible work. So she has been doing her, um, her, her journey through her blackness. But um, and so many young women see Beyonce as a powerful as a powerful woman. So this is this is this is good. I'm not sure we can see Beyonce as a role model, or and I'm not even sure she she defines herself as such or an activist. Um, but definitely, Beyonce is also race blackness and economic power put together producing that uh, that very very strong and uh, complex identity so um yes uh, i think i prefer rihanna <laughs> do you want to to say something of value yes um well, I was not expecting to talk about Beyonce, but let's go. <laughs> so, like, um, well, I would love to say that when you are performing and what people say, specifically in this society, is just the outside. Because we are just, like, very focused on how we look like on the outside, what is our, um, this, like, the confection, you know, like, this is the box. So sometimes, definitely, Beyonce or other people as an artist, they just kind of reflect what we is needed to talk about. What is needed to talk about. And, and we all know, especially in the artistic world, that most of the, um, the dance, the music, um, the, the, the storytelling, and also the power that maybe in other part of the world they talk about spirituality is is at the bottom is from Africa. So for artists at some point, everything is just coming as one and what is being, what's the message have to be delivered, we're just going to try to, to pass that message. And one of the other aspect is uh, performance and especially when you talk about something, um, in that way, like uh, visually, is also a healing for the new generation and the old generation. So th that is one of the key points that I kind of um, I wanted to underline and is also show in the video that I showed you before. Like um, you have many, many, let's say body of culture, I call it them the body of culture because it's not just about like the black body itself, uh, but is the body of culture is an ambassador of story. And let's say is an unconscious ambassador of, of history. And so what happened is most of us, they, they, we don't have um, um, a knowledge, um, uh, an awareness about what we are carrying inside us. So sometimes when we um, go to perform, we just also healing ourselves through what we've been, uh, our ancestors been through. 
So for example, one of the uh, techniques that I use and you know the, the, the guys in the video were talking about that is that I was also questioning their own story. Um, it's, it's also about like uh, um, accepting the responsibility of your own story and accepting the responsibility that you are an ambassador of culture. So, um, so what I, for example, what I do when I work with dancers is also trying to uh, pass them what I know about their culture. Like for example, a Jamaican dancer, he doesn't know much about how the, the dance that his dance is, is actually coming from Congo or from another part of Africa. And this, that discovery is helping that person to process. And when you go on stage, there is a kind of rite of passage, like it's also a release. And that is means accepting the responsibility of your own um, history and story, but also um, um, accepting responsibility of your life. And that accepting that responsibility have to be done from both sides. So whoever you are and whatever, what color you are wearing in this moment, 2021, is your responsibility to um, understand, know more about your ancestor, whatever, what they have done and, and what they've been through from like uh, colonialism and like the victim. Thank you. Thank you, Ophelia. Um, we, um, I'd like to invite the, the participants to send a question um, on the chat, on the Q&A. We have a, a really a nice long comment from Maria Methea, which is not really a question, but she's uh, basically explaining the equivalent of uh, in, in in Senegal to to relate to what you said, Angelica, on the madams um, in Ethiopia. Um, so thanks for this for this comment. Um, if somebody has a question, they can write it down. Otherwise, I will I will continue with mine. <laughs> Patrick, I don't know if you have one. Oh, I have one. So uh, you have a question, a question from Angelica from Alessia Pretrolito. Could you also give us some ex example about the development of colorism in the former Italian colonies, if there is one? Uh, and I mean development, since Italians seems seems don't acknowledge its existence. So do you have uh, example of colorism in the um, in the Italian uh, colonial history? Yes, that, that's very interesting, actually, because um, in my research, I did interview with people born from um, usually white fascist fathers and uh, um, black African mothers. So they were actually mixed, mixed race people. Uh, and it's interesting because I was studying a lot, you know, colorism in the US, for example, uh, if we think about uh, from 1619, uh, how in plantations, uh, uh, lighter skinned black people had privileges that darker skinned people simply did not have. And also white passing was also a strategy used to, um, in a way, um, temporarily concealing your blackness and taking advantages of, of, of whiteness uh, is not as uh, easy as it seems. For example, many people were actually giving back. They were going uh, into um, white society, stealing and giving back to the, to, the, to the black society they were belonging to. So white passing is really fascinating. But in the Italian colonies is interesting because I was expecting to, um, to hear about that. And it's a bit more, uh, it, it's quite different in the sense that for many mixed race Italian born in the colonies, um, it was their Italianness that was really the, um, 
the marker of identity, especially if they had an Italian surname and they knew their father. Many mixed race kids were going to Italian schools and even the abandoned ones, they were going to missionary uh, schools run by Italians. So they were really Italianized in every level. They had to speak only Italian and they had to um, study Italian history. So some of my respondents actually told me how they knew everything about Dante and Divina Commedia and Italian geography, and they didn't know Eritrean history. And they didn't know Tigrinya, they didn't speak the language. So they felt really cut off from, from, from their society. So once they were in Eritrea or Ethiopia or in Somalia, they considered themselves they felt they were something different from Eritreans and from Italians. They felt they were a different group, but in a way, color was not um, a, a, a marker. So there were mixed race. Uh, what one respondent told me, you know, Angelica, light skin or dark skin, still we were N word. And this for me was very strong because she was really telling me when we came to Italy, light skin or dark skin, we were still experiencing racism. We were still blacks. And this is a, a bit what happened to the mixed race Italians who migrated to Italy in the 1960s. They come to Italy thinking, okay, I have an Italian surname. Uh, I speak Italian. They were almost colorblind. They didn't notice their blackness. And then they arrive in Italy and they're called the N word to their face in the streets, in a supermarket, at the hospital. And this is a shocking experience uh, because they, they realize it really makes me think about Fanon when he tells this story, you know, when he goes in the train and this French kid talked to him, calling him the, scared, saying to his mom, mom, look, there is a Negro here. And he didn't even realize he was that. So it made me think a bit about the uh, corporality that um, Ophelia was mentioning. We carry a history. We, our body is not organic matter, it's also cultural matter, historical matter. So we carry the, a lot of history in our body. And uh, so yeah, in, in, in the, when they arrive in Italy, they realize they're Blacks. And uh, they have to rebuild their own blacks and Blackness. They have to rediscover actually their own Blackness. Thank you, Angelica. I think Ophelia wanted to, to say something. Um, yes, I'd like to say something about this discovering the blackness. And this is something that, um, I don't know, what, what has come out a lot is a lot of African people, they arrive to Europe and they find out they are black. So you have to kind of move um, geographically to find out your blackness or in terms of colorism, you have to find your whiteness. Because if you're talking about mixed race, you have also this kind of, let's say, um, dynamics where you kind of have to choose where to stand or you have to choose who you are. Um, but this is, uh, let's say, another topic. What is about the discovering of the blackness is we have to kind of start to say, what is um, what we mean with the definition of blackness? So black means um, all the, the, the stereotype, stereotypical images that a European Eurocentric vision give to the black body or is the African and what is the culture, what is the, 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 um, the powerful story behind it. So it's, it's also uh, needed. Um, a definition of what means to be black, what is discovering the blackness. Um, from the artistic point of view, um, it's very sad that um, this kind of dynamics has been affecting also the, the dance work, for example. Um, let's say that is, is a typical um, thought that ballet is the, the, let's the foundation of all dance. And that is, I believe for me, from my point of view, is a very dangerous um, conclusion. Because 
it's, it's like it's like a bar like having a European passport. If you are an artist that come from a background that have a dance background, I have an Afrocentric vision, you know, getting into production or, you know, passing audition. And, and in order to be accepted, you have to become, uh, you are allowed to be black, but you have to speak the Eurocentric codes. And for me, this is dangerous because it's uh, also limiting what is the, um, the legacy of what our body carry. So discovering the blackness or is, is first of all um, a matter of what we mean by be black. Like what is especially in Italy, what we mean by that. Because my way of be black has nothing to do with someone other, another person, you know. So what I feel like in in dance, it is also and in art, it is always this kind of uh, permission to to go inside you and asking yourself what exactly, how exactly you are defining yourself, because behind all of this definition at the end of the day is what is what we tell in ourselves every day in terms of narrative so and 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 yes and kind of not allowing all the um the society construction to kind of um sabotating ourselves in our journey that's interesting, actually, and uh, made me think, you know, you come from a dance perspective and maybe I come from more academic perspective, but also, obviously, in academia, how certain forms of knowledge are considered the knowledge and other form of knowledges are considered uh, naive, um, not scientific enough to be accepted, uh, marginalized, uh, um, is what uh, Foucault called the subjugated knowledge, right? That knowledge that is not mainstream, that is not taught in schools at the university level. And I think, you know, it's really important to find those alternative knowledges and maybe, you know, in your field, these codes so european knowledge is the knowledge why we don't study is this is what we we try to do also with black history months to celebrate black histories and black culture and we come and we see every year all these unknown names of black people who made incredible discoveries that absolutely we don't know anything about because we don't literally study them. Um, in Italy, for example, you know, I always, I'm really attached to the story of Giorgio Marincola and Isabella Marincola because Giorgio Marincola was a Italian Somali young man. He died when he was 22. He had an incredible story. He fought to liberate this country from uh, Nazi fascism. He should be a hero. And um, when I talk uh, very often with um, the son of Isabella Marincola, Antar, he always tells me the story of, um, of, of, of the, when Giorgio's body was found uh, in, in Trentino. They were unable to identify him they thought, oh, it must be a South African doctor. It took a few days to realize, oh my God, this is Giorgio Marincola. This is the guy who has been doing so much for the resistance. And now we know a bit more his story. Uh, it's important to remember what activists in Rome did, trying to fight in order to title him a name of the Metro Chi. And the Black Lives Matter arriving in Italy clearly triggered all of this. But before that, this is also a very unknown story that should be taught in school. He was a partisan like so many others, and he was also black, and he was coming from Somalia, where there was a colonial and fascist regime. So it's very interesting this, what you were saying, how certain bodies are accepted as the norm. 
and other bodies or other knowledges are dissonant, are out of place, right? And Daphne, probably you also have these in your own studies. Yeah, thank you, Angelica. Actually, I, I will take the occasion to ask a question to Ophelia um, uh, reacting on the on the video you, you show of your work, because you said that, I, I find it really interesting, you said that uh, racism is embodied, like, and, and you were talking in the video about transcending the labels that societies give us. Um, and yeah, I find it really like um, interesting. And, and also the fact that you say, so this colonial narrative is still influencing uh, us on a psychological side. So we kind of like, it's really hard to ignore it. And it's really hard to, to like, just put it on the side. Um, so my question, like, and this is a question in terms of your artic, artistic practice, how do you, so how do you manage to do it? Because being aware of uh, all the racial and gender prejudices that are like embodied in your body and in your experience, how, how do you manage to like negotiating this like black female identity at the end? Like how, how, how do you do it within your work? Wow, this is a really huge question. <laughs> Sorry. No, yeah, thank you. No, it's, it's, I mean, I'm still figuring it out because it's a journey like all of this movement that is happening in the world, it's a human journey that we have to be, we have to do it and have to be done. So like definitely my journey started when I moved abroad and I was in a very different environment and I was observing how I was reacting to what I was seeing. So definitely um, I was not used to some situation where I could see a simple thing like uh, an, an African working in a bank or in a pharmacy or driving a bus. So that reaction was surprising me. That thought in, in my mind was surprising me. I was like, how come that I'm thinking like this? How come that I'm surprised if I see someone similar to me that look like me in a very normal position? So what kind of narrative the society that I have been raised into is being feeding me with? And that was the first step. So I don't think. <laughs> Hello, can you hear so, me guys? Yes. <laughs> yeah. So I Hi, was. Everyone. Hi, everyone. Hi, Dolphin. <laughs> okay, let me switch to, to this. So at least I have everyone here. I'm sorry, guys, but I'm not an internet WhatsApp person. And I, I wake up, I do martial arts, I turn my phone off five hours, you know. Just have a different <laughs> role in this virtual world. I can't, I can't keep up on WhatsApp, guys, you know. But it's 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 really nice that you managed to to yeah to, to come. Like you, you're lucky. I, at four p.m. every day I put my phone on back. Yeah, we, <laughs> we have to say that Delphine, is, where you you in New York, right? Yeah, I'm so, in New York. Yeah. So, I mean, I'll, I'll, then I can like quickly introduce you, and if you want to say some something about your work, it will be really interesting. It will some, definitely add something to the conversation we've been having. Um, I mean, Delphine Diallo. Uh, She's a Brooklyn-based French and Senegalese visual artist and photographer. Mm -hmm. um, she's graduated from the Académie Charpentier School of Visual Art in Paris. Through her work, she combined artistry with activism and addresses themes uh, as blackness, womanhood, and identity. Uh, in her work, she's pushing mm -hmm. many possibilities of empowering women, youth, and cultural minorities through visual provocation, and she notably used analog digital photography and collage. So I don't know, like, Delphine, if you just want to say something briefly about your work and how is it connected to the whole topic of uh, Black female body and its representation, like, if you want to, I mean, you jump yeah, in the so, middle and, yeah. Like, yeah, just, yeah. Just whatever so, you want. So uh, thank you, everyone. I'm really happy I jump in it um, because you know I'm I'm open to discussion, um, even if uh, sometimes it's very hard because I want to create. 
to thank both. Uh, but I'm really happy for the introduction. Uh, I'm based in New York for the last 11 years. I'm French Senegalese and I grew up born and raised in Paris with a French mom and a Senegalese dad. And uh, around like, I'm 43, so around like 30, 29, uh, I was graphic designer working in the music industry. And I felt I had limitation. And this feeling of limitation was not really, I could not understand it. I felt like I had everything. I had a boyfriend, I had a house. I mean, I had an apartment, I got a car, I got a scooter, you know, I was having fun in my life. And then uh, something was missing very deep in me. And I had to figure out what it was. So I left for New York with my ex-boyfriend at the time. And I was trying to find a new way to live life or a different way to understand uh, how I could be a woman into this world. Uh, and in the long run, I start, you know, I broke up with my ex. I stayed with him 14 years. So that's a big part of my transformation because I did someone very young uh, from 16 to 31. And at 31, I got this big, 30s, you know, crisis where I really didn't know who I was and uh, I need to find out. And I was very dedicated to find out my purpose. So I had the chance to meet uh, this famous, uh, very well-known photographer, Peter Beard in 2007, end of 2007, while I was wondering what I was gonna do with my life. And I was still a graphic designer. And um, this man gave me the chance to come with him in uh, the, one of the biggest shoot of his life. It's like a million dollar project uh, called the Purely Calendar. Uh, they were shooting in Botswana in the middle of the Kavongo, in the middle of the most amazing landscape of the world. And I've been, draw I've been drawn to that space with him, inviting me. Um, I was assisting him. I was kind of like creative assistant because I always have creative ideas. And this is where my life changed, where I questioned my body and the purpose of the function of the body in photography. And the reason why I, I asked this is because this white male photographer, Peter Beard, was photographing black women, top model. And I had a discussion about him, about this male gaze, but the name male gaze was not coming at the time. I was like, you know, I don't want you to photograph me naked because I, I'm, I want to be a photographer. Like I, I'm really excited to be a photographer as a career. And as a woman, I don't uh, identify myself with my nude body or my naked body. It doesn't really, it doesn't really help me. So why you want to do it? So this conversation with a white male photographer was starting to, you know, uh, very like sparkling in me this idea of what kind of representation for women, especially black women. And the fact that they've been used through history and through the world of photography and fashion, and even before when it comes to colonization as a object. So the word object for, uh, for a black woman body is really, it was a, you know, a commodity through slavery, even to the story of Afro-American culture. Um, the black woman was really abused, oppressed and used. And I didn't know how deep it was right at the time. It was very, still very young and I had lack of history uh, background, especially when it comes to the African history because I was raised in France, you know? So they keep me really quiet and uh, uh, ignorant for a very long time. That, that, that took me 30 years to wake up, you know, and start a new school. So I started a new school with myself as a self thought and everything started when Peter Beard challenged me with my vision, with my body. And since that day, it's been 11, 12 years now, actually, I answer or had a discussion with the male gaze. So let's say my work is actually a uh, portraiture, black women specifically for the last 10 years, and all the women that I put in my work are connected uh, with kind of a friendship with me. They, 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 this, they're not unknown women. I know them for three, four years, five years, two years, but I have a relationship with them and I respect their truth. So besides to photograph a black woman and a black woman body, I want to pay, I want to mention that the big difference is the fact that I, I care about the subject. I know who they are and I'm 
my intention when I take a picture, it's to give us the light that she gave me, not in the sexual aspect, but in a very uh, spiritual space, you know? So this is the big difference shift because we can talk about the black woman body for a long time, but uh, I think people have still have a very hard time to understand what is the difference with someone, a photographer who, who's shooting through a male gaze and someone who's actually outside of the male gaze. This is something very new for people to understand. So besides talking about, you know, a lot of people know about the oppression of the black woman body, but we, we need to change it. And to change it, we, we only don't need just black photographers. Do you understand what I mean? Because what happened, it's like a replica because black photographers sometimes repeat the male gaze and the male gaze is the male gaze. Do you understand what I mean? The male gaze is, is still stripping the spirituality, putting on the side and, and having more attention, attention to the sexual aspect to it. And it's completely subconscious to the man, you see? And it's not because he's black that is enough. So we have this conversation, like I have this conversation a lot the last 11 years, because I think it's a matter of the, oops, like the, like the eye, sorry, I'm going to go back. Ah, where am I? The eye, sorry. The eye of the observer, the eye of the observer, the person behind the lens, right? Is the one who doesn't have this attention on sexuality within the body. So I hope people understand better about my work now, even if it was like, I mean, maybe five minutes, but hopefully they understand better now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Delphine, for jumping in and, and making this really quick, uh, quick sum up of, of your work. It's really great. Um, I mean, I opened the question to the floor if somebody has a question. Uh, yeah. Maybe I'll start. I, I actually have one. Um, so it's a bit of the same question I asked Ophelia before um, yeah. her artistic um, uh, work. Uh, and, and so how do you make sure that that's actually you don't reproduce uh, the white man uh, imagery because it's so part of like, it's, it's so deeply rooted, this type of like colonial representation, you know, hypersexualization of the black woman, this kind of thing. How do you make sure in your own artistic practice that you're not going to fall into the, the cliche, you know, the stereotypes? How, 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 you do, how do you do that? You have to practice, uh, you know, for me, I, I think the best solution for me is to practice spiritual, spiritual ground, like uh, spiritually, I'm spiritually grounded and I'm practicing spirituality uh, in terms of chi, which is called energy in Asian culture. Uh, it can be called the force within the Bantu philosophy as well, you know, Bantu philosophy uh, all around Africa before every religion and Yoruba philosophy as well. Uh, the intention of the of the person who take the picture it is not to take the picture it's to give the picture to the woman like i am doing this oh you're doing this for you like people say oh you're doing this for you Delphine, because you're an artist and you want to sell the picture it's like that's not my intention like this you believe it's my intention my intention after that i'm doing the work yeah i have to make a living right but before that even before that, that's why the artist is it's like, I'm not dreaming about money or I'm not waking up thinking I'm gonna make this kind of money with this work, right? So if I do, my intention is bad. I, I, I have to create a space where I felt the pictures that I'm gonna give to that woman is gonna help her, you know? So the last work that I did with, um, I'll give an example. The last work that I did was with a, a collection of African art and the black women from Cameroon, Nigeria, a specific place in Africa where we not recognize, recognizing their specific physical form. They're different. They're not Afro-American. They're not from Senegal, West Africa. People are very, uh, very you know, familiar to it. No, they're from Ethiopia, they're from Congo and Nigeria, right? Those three women are different. And I, I bring into the to the space and I ask them when they in the space of the African art collection to choose their object. Right? When they choose the object, they emotionally something happened. I mean, because you know, uh, being a space with African art 
it's it's intense. They choose it and then they choose wisely because most of them choose where they come from without knowing, which is the first process of creativity and process is like, I want to give her a chance to understand her connection deep rooted with the ancestors. As a female, I understand why I want to give it to her. That's my, that's my photography intention. The result of clicking on the button is the end result. Do you understand what I mean? So the problem is because black women are beautiful in many ways, and we've been denied the diversity of a self as a as a excellent, diverse form of beauty from West Africa to Ethiopia, to Sudan, to South Africa, to mixed race like me, people believe I'm from Ethiopia, you know, I can be in Ethiopia, people believe I'm Abisha. Um, this is the diversity of black women who's been denied to us, okay? And that diversity and that us bringing us to the forefront in the fashion industry, in art industry, uh, in every industry, it still have people to respect us finally. You know, not just not just for them, but for us. So the idea is like we need to give this the black women this attention uh, of respect and of and of uh, empowering the ancestor within her. So I'm not above or under her. She's, she's part of the same psyche archetype of all those black women who's been denying their power for centuries. Do you see? Or even before that happened in colonization, we know that those women were running the game. Do you understand what I mean? And that's, uh, I feel deeply in me that my sisters, your sisters, those black women who was running the house and was making decisions, they were the chief. And for me, that's a fact. It's not something that I have to read in a book, you know, and then after I read in the book, but it's deeply in me, like genetically, you know. Thank you, Delphine. Um, Angelica or Celia, do you want to ask something to Delphine or react on what she was saying? Yes. Um, hello, Delphine. It's fine. We're so excited you, you joined us. Uh, what you were saying actually made me think about this beautiful book uh, I wanted to share. Um, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So the I, black female body. Really, uh, yeah. And and Deborah Willis, I think you know this was such an important work. When I read it, it was a bit mind blowing because we are so used to see images of black women taken by uh, white men, especially during the colonial yeah. time, right? And to see these women just as victims, as being forced to be mm -hmm. there. And actually what they say, is, you know, if we just think in these terms, we really, um, if we see these images as purely negative or derogative, we really deny the complexities of black women's sexuality and their role in building yeah. their visual history. Yeah. And um, yes, what you were saying will really make me think about this because we tend to, uh, you know, to deny a bit agency of black women, even the women that are portrayed in a certain way by a white photographer, uh, without denying the violence, the, the oppression, sometimes being forced to be there. But we never think about a woman who actually enjoyed to be there, to, to negotiate also her economic opportunity, to exploit that gaze in, for her own advantages. And so absolutely, I think it was, it was really yeah. fascinating. To, to, to mention the, the evolution of the black woman body, especially in industry, Grace Jones and uh, Nami Campbell are a good example. Right? Yes. So Grace Jones decided to come in the 80s and say, oh, this is how my money is going to come. She was an amazing singer. I mean, she's still today. She's an amazing performer. And she said, I'm going to use my Black female body sexually. Yes. But I am taking power with it. Do you know what I mean? And we knew, we know Grace Jones. And I saw the documentary. That's why I very admire her. It's like, she was not a role model per se for me. She was very unique in a way that she was embodied this sexual energy in her. And the sexual energy which was embodied was very masculine as well. So 
for her, that was not a hard time to play in a white male world. Do you understand what I mean? She she married and she they Jean Paul Good for 15 years, and this white man, uh, Jean Paul Good, was a very fashion famous fashion photographer. Uh, 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 that was a, a, a icon. So they they had a deal here, and the deal was like let's let's be lover, and you're gonna make me rich as well as I'm gonna make you rich. So right. that's a good deal here, right? Mm -hmm. And they exchange works and they're still good friends today. And uh, even if I have to criticize those pictures today, at the time I love them. But more I'm dissecting the way that the black woman body is being used. Uh, uh, um, I may I have to be against uh, completely a sexual idea of the black woman. I think we have enough. That's that's probably what I want to say. You know, I don't want to go back to history and say, "Oh, that that's bad." I was like, the fact that there was only one black woman like Rachel Jones, and she was doing this in the '80s, that really expand the idea of having those black women um, embody themselves as a sexual object without knowing that that was not empowering them. Mm -hmm. And same thing for uh, the '90s and hip hop. Uh, after the 94, 95, after the gangster rap and all this MTV was making millions of dollars on the butt of black women. And the butt of a black woman was not being even good paid on the shoot. So there was a lot of fun, uh, fun way to say it, to not be upset or angry because I, I, I don't deal with anger anymore, probably 10 years ago, you know, when all that stuff was coming. But to make it more sense of it, this is enough. So the 21st century started and still like Lil' Kim, Cardi B, like they have the right to exist. I'm not denying their existence and their success. And I will never be against the success of a black woman. But what I'm saying is like, there is a perpetuation of making sure that the model will not reach the level of consciousness, which I call African consciousness, that should be reached all around the world when it comes to the black woman. And that's why I say, if we heal the black woman, we're gonna heal uh, black people all around the world. And I think there is, there is not enough understanding of the patriarchal society, right? Because male still wants to be the decider and the one in power, black or white actually. So we have a confrontation and the confrontation is like, we're still living in a patriarchal society, no matter if it's black or white. So for us black women, it's like, we're living in a white society it was, it was op oppressing us, right? And if we have to move to uh, uh, the continent or in a black space, the black space is patriarchal as well. And I don't deny that the patriarchy or like masculine energy has to play its role. Huh? I'm not denying the women's taking over. I'm talking about the completely unbalanced of the psyche of the black woman in society and the fact that she's suffering from a, a, a deep pain rooted within the fact that nobody knows who she is. I mean, I talk about myself, but I never met so many black women in New York who were looking for themselves as well. You know, that's why this conversation is because I met more than 500 or 1,000 all around my life as a creative and there is the same rush crush in here you know at different probably level but that reflection that we want to see in the world is not coming from the archetype that white society is giving it to us and and not either from the african side so we need to take our space right and that's the the question that i'm asking with the black woman body is like black woman body um representation need to take another type of space yeah, and, and we got a question from an anonymous um, a person in the audience. That's actually it's a question for the three of you, I guess. First, his or she is thanking all of you for the intervention and then asking, how do we get to a genuine or unbiased gaze in the arts, media, and academia? And I think, yeah, this question is really relevant Exciting. also. Exciting! <laughs> how do you <laughs> Um, first of all, uh, you need, you need, uh, sorry, first of all, can you see me? Yeah, first of all, I'm going to add my battery to make sure I'm not leaving. You have to, we have to make sure we, we, 
we recognizing it's missing. So if we don't recognize there is a bias, and it's only a year or two that uh, Artsy and the people making an article about my work and the male gaze and the white gaze, it's very recent in the academy or art, in, or art industry. So if they now hire women, just because it's fun and it's and it's uh, it's it's the right time, it's not enough. It's like the feminist movement. The feminist movement was only for white women. Do you know what I mean? And, and like the, the bias, it's come from actually creating a division um, of 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 narrative where one narrative, which is the white nuggets, is number one ninety five percent of the time. So the idea is like to change the bias. We need to to have people at the decision, the people at the level of decision to decide to finally choose black women narrative. And I know why I, I was behind or I always do my work on the side and I was, when I'm saying I was, I was never the, the one invited. It's because my story is not the story of slavery. My story is not the story of oppression only this way. My story is a story of black women. Um, where I'm not talking about gender. Do you know what I mean? My, my story is like transcending a body and talking about spirituality. Um, to be able to change the bias in society, we need to have a different ethics and moral, moral right now. And it's, it's, it's for everyone, not just the, the art industry. Ethics, moral, and integrity back to spirituality and consciousness, which I add African consciousness within because it has nothing to do with the history that the Western world trying to put in us in our mind for the beginning that we born, you know, like it's a, it's a, it's a lie. So we need to find a tune in where the narrative of the black woman has value. That's my, that's my understanding about what you ask is like, it's yeah, curators needs to decide to do it. Museum needs to decide to do it. Storytellers, journalists decide how to do it. And they realize they're always choosing the same topics all the time. Lesbian, issues, poverty. <laughs> I can go on forever. It doesn't mean that they're wrong ideas, but it means you put them at the level of, of top notch when it comes to black women. So we always feel like we have an issue. We're not no more people, huh? I have to be lesbian for you to take to, to pay attention to me. Do you know what I mean? I have nothing against lesbian. I'm saying it's like it's divisive and division doesn't relate to the art space that we need to create for a new society. You know what I mean? Yeah. Feminine narrative, female yeah. gaze, white gaze, this, uh, male gaze. It's, it's two things that needs to be balanced, you know? Thank you. Thank you, Delphine. Um, I think we will have to wrap it up uh, kind of soon, I, but I would like to give the opportunity to Angelica and Ophelia to uh, say uh, some last comments on this, if you want. Oh, you don't have to as well. It's like up to you. I would just like adding something to what Delphine was saying and to kind of answer the last question. Um, we are living in a time where it's a really beautiful opportunity to kind of raise consciousness. And when we raise consciousness means we just about like listening to, um, to the others, but also listening our reaction inside us. So, and we not, we don't need to let's say fail in tokenism. I don't know if you never hear about that, it, but it's like just kind of this symbolic act of hiring someone of color of indigenous that, that just mm -hmm. to kind of, you know, it look like that we did the diversity choice. So I would say that the first rule is knowing that none of us is holding the supreme truth. So mm -hmm. I'm not the only color of the truth. And we know that this kind of dynamic shape the Western society. So we all know that inside of our mind, we have that kind of dynamics. So it's, it's all about really listening to what is happening and kind of analyzing our reaction inside of us because what we have to deconstruct first is how we think and how we perceive reality. And then from there, we can start to build what is our society, a new society. So I would just say, that because that's what we do as an artist is always and 
ongoing listening to what happening outside and how my artistry is 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 uh, interpreting it and like looking from different angle and this is a kind of like method that we should have as a fundamental to on this planet as a human so yes yeah, thank you yeah just uh, yeah uh, just to say the, i think the question was about how can we have a genuine and unbiased gaze well uh, I don't think we can, because every gaze is positioned. We are all positioned and we all come from our own perspective. So I'm not sure this idea of genuine and neutrality do exist, at least for me. But definitely we can aim to certain goals. We can aim to social justice. We can aim to certain type of representation. And when we know our position, I think it's much easier to create alliances. If we don't know where we are positioned, well, it's, it's much more complicated. But in a way, we haven't, uh, we've speak, we have been speaking about black women, but also the role of men and black men in all of this, right? Mm -hmm. So Patrick, I don't want to obviously <laughs> make you the speaker for all the black men, absolutely not. But I was curious after all of this, if you have, anything to say, you know, thinking about position and positionality. Uh, okay, welcome to you, Delphine. Uh, I'm so happy to see you in uh, this discussion. And uh, I want to say something, okay? Since I, uh, in my childhood, I was convicted that uh, uh, something goes wrong with my mother. You know, uh, I drove to um, all the time thinking that mm, I don't know, there is something that my mother doesn't do. Uh, uh, and when I look uh, around of me, a young girl, young black. Uh, black female, uh, female. I think so. Uh, there is something that we can't see, or uh, we uh, we can't have the the behavior to to take, no, to to, uh, to do or to play. I don't know, but I think so. Okay, uh, the the queen have to turn back at home. The mother have to turn back at home. Because uh, to reach in this um, uh, paternalistic vision of the uh, world society is not just the fault of uh, masculinism or men uh, involving uh, to the world. It's not just the fault. I think so. Uh, I was thinking with some uh, elder um, uh, women, uh, woman, and she said to me, you know something? I think so we uh, let our responsibility in some time in the story of the world. Mm -hmm. We have now to take the, the position to rule the world. I'm mm -hmm. waiting for the women to rule the world. Female woman as uh, Anzinga Banzi, the, <laughs> the imperatrice of uh, Luango. I am ready. I am ready. Ready? Yes, I, I need this. I, I, because you know, as an artist, uh, I have helped uh, by women, just women, all the time. Yeah. The first yeah. people that uh, believe in me and give me uh, brushes and a painting to draw, to make a, um, a portrait, was a woman. Mm -hmm. uh, she was, she was um, Preto you know, mm -hmm. but really, really present, really efficient Praetor. And the second one, but the first, the first that uh, I can see is my, I can say is my muse was my um, mother-in-law. She, she uh, paid the first brushes for me. She paid the first mm -hmm. lesson uh, of mm -hmm. painting for me. And mm -hmm. my first galleries was a woman. 
my agent is a woman. Women uh, is different, different uh, way to see how to to yeah, yeah. feel the life, how to consider the body. They are powerful. All the women that are around of me are powerful. And when I see, I, I'm not happy to see that. Okay, they used to to say, ah, oh, no, the world is like this, is that, people doesn't want us to give a chance, and no, these women uh, take it with force, with uh, intelligence, with strategy, sure. with all the tools that they recognize mm -hmm. around of, of them. And for me, mm -hmm. I'm waiting just the return of the queen. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, of thank course, you, Patrick. Please. Thank you, Patrick, please, for uh, for acknowledging all the women who helped you in your in your life. I think maybe it might be the first step. We we, we need recognition, probably. Um, I think we have to wrap it up because it will soon be uh, two hours, and here in Italy, it's getting pretty late for the one uh, in Italy. Uh, but I'd like to thank you all, uh, Delphine, Angelica, and Ophelia for your contribution, and Patrick as well. And obviously Black History Month for organizing uh, this amazing event. Um, I had a question at some point of people asking if it will be, uh, if the recording will be available. Uh, I guess it has been recorded. So I guess uh, the recording will be available somewhere. Um, yeah, I just want to thank you all, and uh, and I and I uh, and I invite you to look at the the program of Black History Month Florence in Bologna because there is a lot of more events coming up in the following weeks. So, <laughs> like, have a look at the website, and uh, and I thank you all for attending this amazing event. Thank you. Thank you, Daphne. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Bye bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.